Well, good evening, coaches. Welcome back to the fifth installment, I believe, of our HEO Coach Development Webinar Series. We are thrilled and honored tonight to be joined by Daniel Kachuk. Daniel is a Hockey Canada skills coach. He currently works with the St. Louis Blues uh, in their AHL and NHL program as a skills coach, player development specialist. And Daniel has taken some time out of his very busy schedule to join us tonight to talk about some very valuable topics and, and to share with us some incredible information. So with no further ado, Daniel, I'd like to hand it over to you and welcome. <laughs> thank you. So I'm just, uh, thanks. I'm going to take over the screen, guy, everyone, and I'm going to uh, start right here. Hopefully that, that shows up into your screen and um, we'll get started. So um, thanks for having me, everyone. I've worked. I've worked with some of you in the past before at the, some various sides of it, um, and in general, these are some of the, the chat topics. I always like to ask questions as we get coaches and hockey minds alike, um, and it's what are the toughest skills you can teach, and what skills do you need to be better as a coach for for your team? And we all have something to work on, so just some food for thought, and you can type away into our chat room as we go um and then it also helps educate me on what uh coaches need and what we need to look forward to as we progress with these types of zoom meetings and conferences alike a um, little bit about me um, um from barry ontario um based and these are some of the programs i've worked with uh, i was lucky enough when i finished playing to get started in with the OHF uh, to do my certification and I got work in Jeff Stewart, who's the uh, technical director of OHF brought me in as I was coaching in the OHL. And then I went through HP one, HP two. I was one of the first, I was a group of first coaches to take the certified skills coaching in Canada. And that kind of helped uh, build my path into where I am today. Um, that, also allowed me to work a lot in, with the youth in minor hockey and for me to develop my skills and my own style of coaching, uh, which is where we are. I have crossed paths with some of uh, those that are, of you that are on the call at the Gold Cup and in, inside the POE at the U17 level. Um, so who am I exactly? Like I did, I was fortunate enough to go through the POE way back when and uh, in the mid to late 90s uh lucky enough to play for the world junior team uh for for two installments winning a silver medal i think in 99 winnipeg um what i do on a day-to-day -day basis is is kind of here these are some of our skills coaches at the u17 where um we've brought the skill development program in and we've expanded it and kind of giving feedback and kind of grown it to where we can help our players, not just at that, that elite level, but then push it out across, across our great country on a day-to-day -day basis. I work with, that's me in Chicago in the American league, working with our head coaches and our development team to develop our players and then the development camps that we host in the summer for the players and of course the the clinics i do a lot of this um talking for, you know doing hp1 hp2 um, presenting the skills coaches and doing a lot of these types of presentations to share my knowledge that i've come across and it's not gospel these are just my experiences and it's not a hundred percent, but these are, this is some of the areas I've come across and talking to other coaches. Um, so if this, if you do have a differing point of view, um, don't be shy to share it. These are just some of the things I've seen um, coming across. Um, in my, inside my amateur development side, working with amateurs a lot, I, uh, when I was based in Barrie and I still do it in the summer times, uh, working with various stages of players. We've been fortunate enough to have uh, Tyson Forrester, who's a first rounder um, to Philadelphia Flyers, um, Carson Retkoff, who is also a uh, first rounder now to the Kitchener Rangers, now playing in that inside there. Isaac Phillips, uh, a late bloomer, but one of our 2001s that got to play some of his uh, first games in the National Hockey League this year. And because of the proximity, uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to work with the Toronto Marlies 2002 team with coach Richard Power. And we had a young defenseman named Jamie Drysdale. So I was fortunate enough to see him at a very young age and work with him uh, with his team for a few years as he developed. 
and then on my day to day side, um, this is where, where I kind of, my day job is to work with our prospects here in St. Louis that started off in Chicago, took me over to San Antonio. And then now here in with the Springfield Thunderbirds, uh, where our affiliation is now, uh, I do apologize for some of the, the pitches were blurry. That was the best I can do in a short notice. Um, but some of these guys, now some of them were high picks like Jordan Cairo, second round pick. We had to help him develop his game and, and to help him along his way. But we've also had to work with guys like Sammy Blay, who was a seventh round pick coming out of the queue, very, very raw potential and to help get there and working with these different players to help them round out their game, to help them, you know, get a shot at the NHL and provide that role and that support that they need on a day-to-day -day basis. So inside our program, we've, we believe that to have a skills, uh, kind of my role as a skills coach within the system. So it kind of ties into what we're asking them to do in terms of their style of play, in terms of how many minutes they get, in terms of how they fit into our team and our structure and kind of personalize it. So that message goes up and down the chain uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and in talking with, with Brian initially, and we had roundtabled a few ideas and, you know, I think the, the initial thought was to give you guys, I'm sorry, you coaches, <laughs> um, some drills and to let it go. These are what I've seen, but I, I've already, um, provided Jeff and Brian with some drills, with some skill drills, with some clips, and I'll put a little bit of puck protect at the end. And you can have access to that and you can have that, have a look at it on your own time. And the video quality will be much better than anything provided on Zoom. So uh, I've, I've kind of structured this focus into some of the areas I've come across into um, what coaches can do and how you got, how everyone can get better to improve that player experience. Um, the skills that this group perhaps needs as a, as a coaches, for sure, you're going to need game knowledge, skills, knowing your players, knowing the opponents, all that stuff. You're going to need passion. Um, passion to drive you every day because there are some long hours and not every day is going to be great. Um, the communication skills that coaches will need has changed. Yes, being direct, being presentable, clear, concise language, but also in email communication, text communications, all this stuff is starting to matter in a way that it, it never has before. And I believe this this new era of coaches has to learn to communicate not only in different ways, but also communicate to this new style of player that has different languages, is on TikTok, is on Instagram. They may have a different verbiage. Um, and, and I believe it's, it's up to us coaches to understand and utilize that. Organizational skills. Um, coaches that are, are good, they're just flat out, they're organized and prepared. Um, resourceful. I believe coaches have to use the resources they have on hand, be it other staff members, knowing the ranks, knowing the budget, knowing what tools they can use and when, understanding the resources they can use. Um, use of technology. Some of you may, may be using already. Some of you may be experts at it. But I believe in today's day and age, the use of technology and using it at the right times can be very, very beneficial, but also understanding how to use it and when not to use it, I believe, is something that can be, um, you know, very, very valuable asset as you go along. Um, environmental awareness, understanding sometimes nothing needs to be said so or sometimes you need to interject understanding what's going on at at that time in that player's life or in your team's life i team's uh timeline i believe it's understanding the pulse <laughs> i i believe that's something that you know sometimes coaches can have their agenda and they just continue on without reading their environment or reading what's going on in that given situation um a conflict resolution for coaches, I believe it's it's become more and more um, needed for young coaches, even at the junior and pro levels, just understanding how to manage conflict and to, to find resolutions that can maybe, they might not be perfect, but at least get issues um, resolved. Um, for this young group of coaches, 
also sales and recruitment is <laughs> absolute paramount skill nowadays to you know sell yourself but also sell your program that to players to parents to agents that what your you can provide in terms of player development experience that that's going to be right for that player and i believe that that's maybe you can rest on your record but it seems to me more and more that being able to, to sell to be able to recruit for young coaches to have the little bit of those skills can uh, benefit you greatly and i think now now more than ever you're not only coaching a player in your team you're also coaching your parents um as well because of the access uh that they have um to you you have to also coach the parents as well um hopefully that's that's ringing us uh, some some bells into what you, you coaches are going through um the coach environment nowadays i think it's it's gone into these areas more and more maybe some of you are going through this your time your time is getting squeezed more and more and these are all kind of interconnected whether it's the text on the cell phone be it back and forth after the game ideas everybody wants to share their opinion and but what that does is that will go into your work day, that will go into your personal life, your family life, your vacation time, all this kind of stuff is going on. Um, the data, which I have by the matrix on there, everybody's measuring everything right now from, from your face off to how you're performing to the minutes you have, all the data is there. And it seems like more and more you're, you're bombarded with all that data all the time, even at the youth levels now. And it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, you know, we're in the information age and how quickly that's uh, shared to you by everyone around the team. Um, and then the last bottom corner, um, there's, there's the video camera. It seems there's even now stationary rinks, stationary cameras at every rink, everything you're doing. So, it's it feels like you're in the big brother world right now that you are being taped and it's going to be uh, criticized, analyzed, you know, and you never know when it's, when it's going to come up. But uh, that's the environment um, this new era of coaches is dealing with, even at the youth levels. Um, so what are your what are your players going through at this time and. I, I believe it was much simpler um, back in the day. And as a player, you know, going through this myself, and that's a little bit I, I coach based on my experiences, stuff I liked and stuff I didn't like. But it's also now sitting back as a coach and touching a lot of different areas and talking to players as they've gone on through and how many layers of influence they have in their young career from a young age, all the way from Adam to Pee Wee, Bantam Jr., and so forth is their circle of influence. What impacts their day? Um, so it's amazing. And then, you know, at the top, you know, parents and family, that's, that's always been there. Um, and then you move on over to your club team coach, where I believe a bulk of the, the attendees on this call, that's, that's where, where you are. And you've always had a, a guiding voice in these young players' careers. But then you start to now get into you know, agents and, vi and advisors, they're, they're in their ear, they have a vested, they're selling, they're giving them, you know, here's what you do here, here's what you do how. Um, the strength and gym coaches, they're there, they're in their ear, what to eat, how to eat, when to eat, all that stuff. And that's happening at a younger and younger age. Um, skills coaches, someone like myself, you know, the way your business spending lots of time Time throughout the year now it's not just a summer thing we're keep in touch with that player on an ongoing basis about their game if the stuff we're working on is working or say hey you know maybe you could have done this and this this execute this play at this time um, we're seeing at that at the nhl level as well because the outside skills coaches are having a little bit of voice in that player's ear throughout the year um spring coaches perhaps you are a spring coach yourself but that's something that goes on um throughout the year now that you know uh, if you're on the toronto bulldogs or you're part of these elite pro pro hockey development teams these coaches will have constant contact with the players through on out and then when you work on over kind of the left 
bottom side. These are kind of some indirect stuff um, that are influencing what what what's going on in, these, in players' lives is the peer group and the competition. It used to be in our era without the internet, it was just kind of what you see, you maybe see other good players at tournaments. I remember great player out of the Ottawa area named Andre Signoretti at CMI tournaments. And that was kind of the measuring stick of good player out of Ottawa, wanted to beat them or a player named Rail Blair out of Detroit, uh, part of the 79 class those, but you would see them. Now everybody's seeing their peer group on an ongoing basis because it's getting posted, it's sold, stats are posted, there's rankings of players at young age, and that's influencing these players onto what maybe drives them or what frustrates them or trying to influence their play to perhaps get the next best Instagram clip. Okay, then that's tied in a little bit to the social media aspect of it. And now even so, uh, for those of you that have touched on Instat, now there's data and analytics, as I mentioned with the, with the Matrix. There's data and analytics on these young players at a young age. I have a young player that went through our Barry program. He's down at uh, Culver Academy, and I'm pulling up his shifts, and there's data, and I'm like, it's, it's high school hockey. But – there's all this added information and the players are understanding it because it's being communicated back to them all. You only had two shots on that, or you need to get to the scoring area here. Or this is a better play here. So all these little things are influencing the player and that's more so than it's ever been. And what does that exactly do to your player? Okay. That uh, invariably just adds to the player's anxiety. Okay. It's, there are players that every, like we said, with the camera, every rep is recorded and it's every rep is being coached. It seems like the mistakes or the corrections or the, the good plays are being overemphasized over. There's too much positive feedback at times but that's going on on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the year. You're seeing players get on the ice and now they're looking up in the stands. Oh, did that mistake get caught? Did my parents catch that? Am I going to have to hear about that in the car ride home? Um, with all that circle of influence, these players, you want to make everybody happy. You want to be liked. These are, you know, some of them are mentors and you're trying to please too many people all the time. And you're compared to everyone all the time <laughs> okay that adds to a player's anxiety um there's family costs and there's also just feels like there's all these little in, inherent pressures and where does that bring us to this part of the discussion as I, I believe as coaches we have to understand is this is not going away so we have to do what we can to improve our our players environments perhaps simplify it a little bit and get the right messaging across at the right time and perhaps you know, give these kids a chance to enjoy this game because that's where ultimately they're going to perform and develop the best and be the best players for your team and perhaps play for the team as well. Okay. Uh, is there anything in the chat here? I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay. I don't see anything in there. So I'm going to uh, continue on. So how can we help? help these modern players with some of the areas that we can control as coaches. I, I do believe uh, you, you have to teach tactics over systems as much as you can. Um, systems come and go, but your players, I believe, why they may be a good player for you inside a system, you may be handing them off and hopefully to a higher level, perhaps be a junior pro, Team Ontario, perhaps – Team Canada, that, that tactics will always trump systems. And if they have really good understanding with the skill set, they're, they're going to be able to adapt to anywhere. Um, and those are the players that I believe have the best chance and they have a little bit more versatility uh, to succeed in any type of game plan. Um, understand as coaches, the cone, cone of learning that while you may introduce something, it will take a skill, a tactic, it may take some time um, before it becomes second nature to them and they will do things automatically. Um, app uh, the application of skills and tactics inside your game and find those little hooks where they're there, they're halfway, 
you know, encouraging them, but also correcting them, keep moving, keep moving and needling them over into the areas of success and using your understanding of the player and the terminology and the tone of your voice can be really, really key at those times. And as much as you can identify and simplify, you're the experts, they're looking to you for guidance. And if you can kind of keep it simple, but identify perhaps just one or two things at a time, they'll, they'll pay, pay a lot of dividends for that, for that player in the long run. Um, for these coaches, I believe now more so than ever, providing the context to the situations of the games is key. Uh, these players are seeing with what they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis inside that social media, inside the YouTube clips, they're seeing very, very abbreviated snippets or highlights, and they're not looking at the overall game, right? What's happening in the game? What's the point? Did we just have three shifts in a row where our team was bombarding our D zone? Did we have, you know, they see a big hit, but our, did our team just have three penalties in a row? So should I put myself in a position to take another one? Uh, where to apply the skill? And I, the time of the game, are we one goal lead or are we one goal down? And I think that that's where the real coaching, the, the on the grass, at the ground level, when you're on the bench, when you're in the room, when you're when you're addressing your team, providing that key context that nobody else can provide is what what the what uh, us as coaches have to do. And I think if you're when you're communicating the last point here, um, when you're communicating the players, remember. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say players are selfish. I don't think they are, but I think there's an inherent what's in it for them, them and what's in it for the team. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think you have to find a way to bridge that gap while communicating both at the same time when you're addressing your players. Okay, this is what's in it for, the, for you as a player, but this is in the bigger picture what's in it for us as a team and how we can all benefit to try to find those win-win scenarios. And I think finding your style, finding your common ground can help serve you greatly as you progress with your team. Sorry, my screen's a little bit frozen here. So I'm just gonna try to go on out. There we go. And then uh, getting into some of the best practices for coaches, some of the tips and stuff that I, I believe uh, the better coaches have out there in the world. Um, maximize your resources. That's everything from ice time to other coaches. You have a goalie coach, use them. You have five coaches on the ice, use all five. Find ways, get ideas, use them as defenders, use them as puck movers, use them as decoy. Have plans for them, okay? The rinks you go to, know how many nets they have available, know if the Zamboni guy can give you the extra 10 minutes instead of flooding. All these little things can help maximize your resources and improve your player's experience and perhaps improve, improve the overall performance of your team, okay? New drills are great. Please limit them to a couple new drills only at a time. It's, it's amazing to see coaches will go to Go to a clinic, they'll see another practice, and then they'll introduce all new drills to the players, and everybody gets all confused. They're new drills to the you coaches as well. So try to only introduce one or two at a time, or just take a piece of a new drill and then add the layers to it. Okay. The third point there, this may be something that I really hang my hat on on a day-to-day -day basis. I perhaps isolate aspects of drills or systems more so than everybody else, because I, I believe they're links in a chain. And if I can isolate certain aspects, it allows me to speed it up, slow it down until the player really re resonates and gets it, and then adding layers to it. So I found that's a great method for me to get the desired skill development in my player or and or team in terms of a system, okay? And then, gets into the next point. The, the best coaches out there will take any drill, the package I sent you, you can take that drill and it, any of them and adjust it for your players. And you can adjust the drills individually 
for the players inside your team. Inside minor hockey and junior, even at pro, we have guys that we have players that can do the, the, the drills up at this level, this level, and this level. And I have to be able to adjust those drills so each player can get in the desired window of development in terms of how successful they can be to challenge them just the right amount so they can get one, the most out of that practice and enjoy the practice as well. Okay. And when you're doing that, invariably, now you're working alongside the players. You're not sitting on the perch and just barking orders. If you're doing that, you believe me, the players will respond. Okay. The best, and to the next um, point, the best coaches, when they're running and they're running efficiently, they transition from one drill to the next. Um, they maximize time and efficiency. And the players, they do respond. They do respond and they will give you more attention when things are on, when they're moving and it feels like you are ready for them and you're not wasting their time. Okay. And lastly, getting into what we, what I mentioned before on the skills for, for this coaching group, be, be able to communicate to everyone. Okay. Um, some coaches are great at communicating, but only to a select few. Realize that if you are in this coaching world, you will have to now communicate to the players, to coaches and the parents. What's the plan? What's going on? And that can help serve you um, greatly and, and help even if stuff goes wrong. But now they're like, you know what? They had a plan. They tried it. You know what? Let's move on. <laughs> Instead of it being disorganized, didn't have a plan, didn't communicate to everyone. Now it gets into those little side discussions that end up frustrating everyone and comes back on the coaching staff. Um, my advice to those parents, I get asked all the time, you know, how, what should I look for in, in um, selecting coaches or the team I go to? And what I say is go watch a coach's practice. That will tell you a lot about how a coach is addressing the team and our players really going to develop and perform to their max and also their experience. I believe that if, if you do watch aside from a record, take, turn that off. But if you go watch how a co a, a, the best team with the best 40 and all record, go watch that coach's practice. Maybe it's not so great. Okay. And conversely, there could be a team that's really struggling, but if I watch a coach practice, you can really tell if that team is going to have a better record by the end of the, uh, as they progress throughout the year or not. And I believe that that's one of those indicators of a really good coach is how they, they run their practices. I'm looking deeper into practice. And this is a very simple slide. Some of you may have seen it before and I've left it blank on purpose because I want you to, I'll give you a second to try to, Think about what those lines actually are on the x-axis and the y-axis and what those lines in the middle are. And what I'm trying to look at in terms of practice. So if we take it a step further and we move on down to the next, it's on the bottom, those are your drills, your reps and your time. And on, on this up down, you have the success rate inside of the drills. Okay. Do they fail all the time? Do they, do they make it half the time, 85% or a hundred percent of the time? Okay. I suggest I would, my thought is watching most practices at the pro junior youth levels. Coaches love it. They see their practices at this level right here but that's not the optimum development level, okay? What we see in the three zones here, okay? And some of you may have seen this before and it's from the talent call, but it's been discussed a lot in a, a lot of development circles from soccer to football, rugby, um, mu music, all that stuff is down here. If they're succeeding somewhere around underneath 65% of the time, that is survival, okay? That's where Navy SEALs train kind of, and if you hang out down there too long, it will force you to quit. Okay. It will force you to not enjoy, even if it's hockey, not so much. Okay. When you start to creep above that 80, now there is some 
you know, it's not an exact science yet, but once it seems that you creep above that 80 to 85%, you know, in this, in that region there, now all of a sudden you're in the comfort zone where you're on too much autopilot, you're not mentally engaged, you're not stretching your skills out enough, and you're just kind of what we would say going through the emotions. Okay. And then now that desired in between area there, between 65 and 85%, that's what we would consider the development sweet spot where you're just succeeding enough, but you haven't mastered it yet. So you can continue to do that drill. So that's where, you know, as coaches, that's if you can kind of use that as a guide into how challenging your drills should be, be it skills and or systems, that's where, you know, perhaps you're going to develop the most. Now, can you have a drill that is up in the comfort level? Sure. Can you have a drill that's survival? I do it all the time. I love it. But overall, you need to understand that over the course of time, your team, your players kind of have to average out to me. It's my thought. Have to average out over that hour or that week need to be over overall into that sweet spot area. I've always, uh, when we get to the POE at the U17, that's kind of when we approach our skills areas and practices, that's where we want to be. We want to challenge them at that right level. And we believe that's where we, and the energy is always, can't get any higher when we're at that level. Um, other thoughts on tip and tips on in coaching and coaching development, um, positive feedback, slippery slope we've we've gravitated towards this over and over and unfortunately now our kids are getting so much positive feedback on areas that they need to improve and they end up hitting a wall at some point um 10, hours um it's it's got to be direct practice okay highly intense focused i love it when players or coaches say yep yeah, my kids are at the at the rink 10 hours there's 10 hours no, it's just not physically possible to be that engaged. Okay. Um, so remember, and I believe there's a thought of negative hours when your kids are sitting around twiddling their thumbs, that's not development. That's actually making them hate the game even more. Um, and one little tip I would have when you are introducing new drills, perhaps you can grab, you know, if you have a really alert player or someone, you maybe you can name the drill after them. Make a league dog. Say this is how this drill is going to go, and you're going to you're going to be you're going to be going first out the drill to get it right, and everybody tends to fall. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, be be authentic. Know your strengths while improving on the areas, but still be you. Amazing on how many coaches will get to clinics, you know, or they see other successful coaches and they try to try to imitate that style. It just doesn't work. You're all great coaches. Be yourselves improve your weaknesses but still still gravitate to the strengths that you have that make you great coaches um and don't be afraid and the last point there don't be afraid to change when things are winning um i see coach, oh, things are going good we're we're, we're, we're not going to change things up but that's almost the best time to change it because you have them you can stretch them out maybe you know you can try get try players in different positions maybe you can add new layers into your system maybe you can add more passes that's the perfect time to change. Because what happens is if you're only changing when things aren't going great, it feels like panic to your team. So I, I believe that coaches should be always looking to improve and adapt and or change on a consistent basis. And that way, when you do really, really need to change things when things aren't going well, it's nothing new to the players. It's nothing new to your, to your team. Okay. Development and process. Um, I, I should mention because I have gravitated a lot of my work into this skill area and everybody's always asking me, how do you define it or how does, how do you look at it for the St. Louis blues and the way we look at it, increased skill and versatility for a player is increased options. Okay. Take that defenseman. If he's going back for the puck and he's only got one skill, which is and off the glass of note is a skill. There's lots of guys, just doing that made lots of money for a lot of years and won won a lot of cups. But if I can take that same defenseman that has that skill, now I can add a wheel element. I can add a first pass element. I can add a deception element. Now that player has four options to exit the zone. 
and our team has four options, which gives us increased versatility based on what our opponent and the options available are, okay? In my day-to-day -day life, I look at lots of stuff like this, where we're looking at a system. The left side is neutral zone coverage, which happens to be a 1-1-3. The Winnipeg Jets, we've seen them a lot. We're playing this at one point, and one of our upcoming opponents is doing that exactly. And on the right, it's perhaps a neutral zone regroup or an attack plan. Inside my day-to-day -day life, I have to look at that system and, and realize that there are different skills applied. For instance, this, this player here in the red X on the left-hand side, that's someone that has to have standing skills, angling skills, but all our players need that. So while it's nice to have the system, we do recognize that there are some skill components into executing our systems correctly. So we have the best chance to win and that player can have success in that system. A lot of what comes across our plate is understanding that there are hardware skills and they have to be intertwined with the software skills um, for that player. Your hardware skills are the skating stride, the shooting. But what makes hockey great is you have to combine it with the hockey sense and the team tactics. And I love the term Hockey Canada is used at the POE, which is because hopefully at the end of the day, as we get there in the competition where winning does matter, that they can use that and perform on demand to be the best assets we have. Okay. So effective uh, practice considerations. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much because um, I do have some little tidbits I do want to share with you um, in terms of video and so forth. Uh, this is my motivation uh, for working inside this POE, working with HEO, the OHF, OMHA Hockey, Hockey Canada, is that uh, some of these players have, I've been fortunate enough to work with at the U17 and some have come from my minor hockey region and some actually are St. Louis Blues products. And it's, it's always great um, to see when they do perform and they get to that highest level. And I sure hope that they, we get to see them perform at that level um, there in August. Okay. I've added this to for Brian and Jeff, they're going to share this with you. So I'm, I'm just going to show you the slides and you can peruse them at, at your own time. And it's uh, I put together some little things on puck protect, some of our best players inside Canada on puck protection, a new way of looking at puck protect. So that's all in there in terms of how we now look at certain areas inside of it and what that can do for your player and your team. So there's NHL clips and even some practice clips um, inside of that. So these slides are all in there. You can look at them on your own time. Um, if you have questions, I left my email as well. So perhaps you can uh, reach on out. Um, I'm going to just change a little bit of a mode here. And I'm going to go to the video. Hopefully that shows up for everyone. So this is our, when we get to um, Hockey Canada inside the, the coach certificate program, this is what I love the most working with coaches is a bunch of coaches getting on the ice, sharing their passion, sharing their thoughts. Um, this happened to be my area. And we were looking at areas of puck protect and, and strength, working with coaches, getting on them, um, work on the details, discussing the, the little angles, stuff like that. And I think that when we go across different areas of our country, that's what makes our game great is when we do get on the ice together and we do get, we're working with each other, working on drills, and these are all coaches. And I encourage you to, when you're working with skills and tactics of your team, you don't have to be able to execute them. You don't have to be rock stars, but just to be able to try them out. And that will serve you greatly when you're, when you're communicating with your players, how to do drills and so forth. We work on a lot of different stuff out there. This was wall pickup elements, and we were discussing angles of stick and shoulder check areas and how to do that wonderful stuff. And I do hope that this group of coaches is able to get to do clinics like this and to get, whether it's in Ottawa or with OHF or hopefully at Hockey Canada down the road, I do hope that you get the coaches can do that. And that's what I love about this game is 
the collaboration, the sharing of ideas, and then hopefully pushing it on down to the players. These clips are also in the puck protect that I've sent on to the coaches. And I've also been, I've also shared um, some of our skills practices here with the Springfield Thunderbirds, where we've taken half the team, uh, we divide it and shared them. So you guys, you, you coaches can look at that, use them if you like, share your thoughts, adjust them for your team. So you have some practice, some different practice ideas that you can take uh, to your home centers. Uh, for me, I'm lucky enough. I do work with a great organization here in St. Louis where we're able to uh, capture a cup. But on my day-to-day -day basis here in Springfield, we do, do have four HEO members. Um, Jeff Jordan, who works a lot with our video and our technical, keeps the things moving, also a good coach. Uh, did coach Team Ontario at the Canada Winter Games. And uh, Nathan Todd, who played for, also for your 67s. We brought him over, Will Bitten, brought him over from uh, Minnesota in a trade. And Matthew Peck, who's up in the lead league. League, league leaders in scoring also had a call up to NHL this year where he performed great. So we do have our HEO representatives here doing well with the St. Louis organization. And uh, I'll leave it there, stop the share, and I'll let uh, Brian um, take over. Thanks, Tucker. Awesome information. Lots to unpack there. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I haven't seen anything come in. But if anybody has any questions that you've been hanging on to, uh, now's a good time. Just uh, feel free to unmute. Um, I've got a couple of things I'm going to throw out if there's no questions, but I'll give the coaches on the call uh, first dibs. So if you have any questions for Daniel, uh, unmute and fire away. Yeah, I've got one. Um, great presentation. I, uh, my question's about, you, you talked about players that are raw and, and how you take them to the next step. Can you... Can you expand on that a little bit? Someone who's just really good at talent, like what is the next step? Is it hockey IQ? Is it decision making? Well, that um, that definitely comes to the player, and it's a, it's a great question. And the, the the real challenge is so let's take Sammy Blazer. He was a seventh round pick out of the queue. You know, he was brought in. He was the worst player at Traverse City. Okay, he was. You would have laughed at him. They were, they were, we were like even our other scouts were like, we drafted this guy. But I'll tell you this. We had to find wins. There was raw talent. He had size. He had coordination. He had hockey instincts. He had jam. But when we looked at him, okay, so we had to make these little incremental steps. Where can we find our wins? Okay. Okay. Let's get you back. What's inside the dots. Okay. Every time that happened, reward it. Okay. If we presented that idea and we were comfortable there, then we moved on to some other areas. Okay. It was kind of a little bit of, just give little tidbits. And, you know, uh, Craig Berube, who was our coach at the time, was like, what's Sammy doing there? I'm like, we haven't got there yet. That's next month. Okay, let that one slide. Otherwise, we're going to overcorrect the player all the time. And then he's not going to enjoy the game, and we might have lost him. Okay, there was things like, okay, let certain things slide. Pick a few different areas. and But you have to hook it in. Okay, so let's just say we, we Sammy was an example. And, he did, he had great hands, but he would try to go through everyone all the time, but he's big frame. And we're like, here, well, every time you get the puck in this situation, all we're looking at is protect the puck. Don't expose it right there. Cause it was a key area of the ice turnover is going to be a two on one, one way, but otherwise we end up at least sustaining ozone pressure. So we just stayed with that. Now there were times where he tried to protect the puck, but he lost it and it still ended up a two on one. Now, as a coach in that situation, what do you do? Do you chastise them? Or is this one of those key teachable moments where you're like, hey, great instinct. You, you made the right decision to protect the puck, but now it's an execution problem of the skill. And that's where coaches really have to identify, was it perhaps a decision miscue or is an execution miscue? Or sometimes the opponent just does something really good, right? And I think that's where the key teachable moments are, is to recognize those little elements you can, you can interject that nobody else can for that player. Another great example I would have, okay, and I bet you if I said, how many of you have defensemen that are really worried about their mobility and you're trying to get them to gap up? 
take the gap, manage the speed because you're, they're going to get burnt by the speedy player playing for the Ottawa 67s. And most of you, yeah, okay. So what they do, player tries to gap up, gets burnt. Now all of a sudden, hey, you just gave up a breakaway. That's your fault. It's easy to pin. Defense, last point of defense, last point before they get to the now. Do you want to teach the gap up? Okay, let's get you trying to gap up halfway. <laughs> so it does, right? And to work it. That decision was great. Now we're going to work on your execution, your footwork, and your mobility to build that in. And over the course of time, now that raw talent will be able to execute it. And perhaps they may have adapted that skill. And maybe all of a sudden, especially in these youth ages, they get bigger, they get stronger, they hit puberty. And now all of a sudden they have something because they were had to do it when their physical tools weren't as caught up yet. For those, this is this is Ottawa, right? There's no better example than Alex Foreman. Okay, he came out of our Barry area, played for Wendell Clark's team. He was a great player growing up, but then through those kind of those um, puberty years, well, I don't know, I have a better term, but he just didn't grow. So he was, you know, five foot six, 110 pounds kind of thing going in his draft year. So then he kind of got moved to the Rebels after winning the OHF. But the raw talent was still there. Then all of a sudden he started to grow. So he, London drafted him in the 11th. By the time he hit London, he was now six foot, six foot, six foot one. And he could fly because those fundamental skills were there. Then all of a sudden he goes in the second round. He played games as a teenager at the NHL level. Okay, so sometimes you just don't know, but if the right building blocks are there, it can really serve the player down the road. I hope that shed some light. <laughs> sure, but uh, that's how we tackle it. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I've got one. Uh, it's uh, Pierre here. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> I a question about the uh, uh, creativity for, for defensemen. Um, so many, uh, uh, we, we all seem to do it. It's the focus tends to be on the, on the forwards, um, that kind of thing. Is, can you suggest uh, some ideas in terms of uh, tactics, skill development for specifically defensemen? Um, it, it, sometimes they get, they get lost in the drills, right? This drill is for, the forwards and so the defensemen wind up being pylons right right uh, yeah so like for for the young d and it's the there's really there's a couple things going on in terms of what these players are seeing now they're they're being inundated with kale mccarr quinn hughes these really mobile defensemen that have a lot of rope and they believe that to be creative and to create offense they got to be that mobile that dynamic OK, there's lots of little simple things we can do as coaches to improve their creativity, to improve their offense. OK, we want them to have the puck on their stick a little bit more. We want that their shot attempts are a little bit more dangerous. We want that they get up in the fourth man's ice and attack. OK, build it into your drills. OK, build it in, because if they if they don't do it in practice, it's going to be really hard to set them into the games. But the key is, and even with our forwards, we want our forwards to be creative, but we want them to, at this level where, where hard jobs are on wins and losses, we still want them to have, you know, responsible offense. We want them to understand where the lines of the ice are, when they're getting squeezed, how they can manip manipulate pressure. And that's where the key is for you, for you coaches, is when you're building that in. Say it's a deception walk line move okay at the line where it's a shoulder fake it's a misdirect whether it's their head their hands their feet their stick can you add that in there okay when they're in fourth man's ice if they're on the entries do you give them rope into yes you're able to go when it's an odd man rush but where's your lair okay and you can build layers in but we we understand that being a defenseman you still got to play defense so if you're now leading the rush all the time, you're never back, it, it becomes very difficult. Yeah, but 
in saying that you have to build the little bit their skills and they have to practice it all the time right you you're saying yeah do a fake or you know we want you to walk the line and how many of your d are you comfortable not only walking the line off the wall inside the dots walking it to the midline point and now walking it all the way across or perhaps down right well if they're ever going to do it in a game you have to put that into the practice and them being comfortable to do it and you're as coaches building a little bit of that awareness in the system look we got a lot of time at the points we don't just have to try to just get it through all the time we can build that in but they're going to have to be comfortable so doing it on their own doing it now with token pressure perhaps at a coach and then doing it live in practice versus other another opponent that's trying to actually defend it right but they have to build that and then teach over top of it here's where you should you could have walked a half here's where you could have walked the whole way and here's where you should have just got it back down on in and that's where the that's where that's why coaches are irreplaceable because you're going to interject that right there and help guide them into where how provide that key context into how to get creative in the game thank you excellent anybody else you mentioned layers there could you could you expand on that a bit i think i know what you mean but i just want to be sure in terms of layers of the well, you talked or... to, yeah layers of attack with the, the d-man jumping into the fourth man's ice but then you well, yeah. reference layer um for sure like now layers in offense this is changing uh the way that the trend in the game is i'm big on like trends where we're forward so we can be ahead of them is it's not even just forwards d fourth man's ice we look at the way we defend is one two three four five and the way we attack is one two three four five actually a lot of our best drivers is our defensemen we have a big rig uh, number 55 colton Pareko. His speed and his ability to exit the puck because he is a horse. He's a six foot five horse out of out of Met, Alberta. So he he penetrates the middle of the ice. He kicks it out. Then he now he drives the net, and that opens up the ice for our forwards to make seam passes. But he's also gotten it a few times, right? So we're trying to build layers in terms of not being flat. So there's a little bit more of a triangulation using the ice, using things like strong side post line on on entries weak side seams analytically we want the goal across you know the, the midpoint line because that now turns a grade b into a grade a you know how we flash on through in our d understanding the timing right on where the track is so our our defensemen our layers are scanning the ice sit particular on the entries they're scanning the ice all the way from the, the time we get the puck, where's their track, where are their numbers, where are they most vulnerable? And that now adds our layers to the attack. What that does is that allows us to play a lot quicker and everybody is working for the man with, or the player, sorry, they're a female, the player with the puck. And that's what we're trying to do in terms of layers. And we're trying to do that on the defensive side too. What are our layers? If there's one breakdown, do we have layers that can help support that and until we recover into strong defensive posture one two three four five and coaches that really under that are hoping to understand this concept put different players at different layers forwards don't always have to be the puck carrier lots of times the deer are now wide ice and they have drivers in there on the half wall trying to assess the next next best play for the coaches and this kind of ties into um the, the previous question is when we're running those drills and you'll see inside uh, the skill drills I sent you, we have our forwards doing the D drills or, or D doing the forward drills because that's the way the game is going right now for us to play quick. I can't every game, at least four or five times, we have a forward going back for the puck because it was a D one stand puck got strong side chip and he's tracked over top so guess what he's going back into our own with his nose going towards the glass how does he do that and conversely we have defensemen on those entries with the puck in their hands which is what was traditionally just a forward's responsibility so they need to have that versatility and skill the, the way the game is going it's just too fast and you can't 
always gets sorted into forwards and D. Our forwards have to box out at the net front all the time. Why? Because the offensive schemes now have three, four guys dragged up into a high ice. So it, it serves us as coaches to teach them both sides of that equation all the time. Any more questions? Raymond, I see your hand up. You're still on mute, Raymond. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Just having trouble trouble finding it there. Um, as we you know, really move to a quick, quick transition game, uh, what kind of real individual tactics have you found to help players adapt to that and not having them sort of a, a step behind as the as the game starts to move up a ice, ice a lot quicker? I find a lot of the younger forwards are having a harder time adapting to that. And is there anything that you found has really worked in communicating that and working on, on, a, on an individual tactical basis? Yes, um, definitely on the, it's a great question. In terms of like what we're doing and, uh in the teaching first is the recognition that we there is a transition going on so it used to be when we had the puck now we're on offense now we're teaching understand when we have the advantage of the puck so you know brian i understand i got a stick on the puck but brian's now got the puck is loose but he's probably got a five foot step ahead of the next player on the opposition we now have the puck so i'm acting accordingly skills for this okay and invariably you're going to need to be able to do a couple things for your team uh tight turns the skating skills component right you don't want to stop and start that's a place where you can build speed and really get the advantage of the attack but passing skills in terms of indirects okay if you want to play fast indirects and passing two spaces okay uh when i look at a lot of and what i we have one inside inside there is because we were everybody when we're catching these teams in transition they're coming at us one way and the other and we always thought you had to pass to their tape or pass ahead of them but the windows for us at our level is actually passing sorry i don't passing it on the ass of a player so actually passing it purposely a couple feet behind me so now banks and goes into the space that i can skate onto it much quicker OK, so these are skills that we're working on at a pro level because that's what ties into that's where the offense is. So we can have more speed at the line to penetrate and get into that house area. So those transitional skills now our players have to handle these passes. Right. So passing off the boards and indirect into spaces using end walls, sometimes not even just the sideboards using end walls or or just laying it into the area. You're seeing these kind of alley oop passes. Calgary had a beautiful one the other day. It was it was awesome. But we're using a lot of those skills because it allows us to play faster. And I'll tell you this, there's nothing that Fords love more. Don't put it to my tape. Put it to the area so I can just skate onto it, and that'll serve you better. But those, those defensemen, too, in that transition game, you're seeing not only move it, but the D2, if it's going to be moved north, get up in that ice. You know, it's going north, and we're going to get to the offensive zone. Get up, get up there and be that next wave of attack. But also, invariably, while you're doing it, what happens if the puck turns over? You've now set your gap up. So those little things are where, even though you can say, hey, we turn the puck over, we're going east, west, one east, west max, and we're going indirect up the boards. But what does D1 do? Does he get up? Does he get up into the ice so he can be the next wave of attack? Or he's now presetting his gap should that puck now turn on over? But that's where uh, you have to figure it out. I'm not sure what level you're coaching, be it Pee Wee, Bantam, Jr. Uh, minor pro i'm not sure but that may adjust on how you where you teach on those layers we appreciate that yeah it's going to change a bit of the communication for sure uh, talking about getting to space we're just so used to on tape at the younger levels right yeah. you have to adapt your communication so appreciate oh, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah i hear you. yeah like I'm, I'm telling you indirects are your friend like pittsburgh's used it for years right like they didn't want they were rimming it and just tipping it into spaces because their fours are like, hey, I'm going there. Just put it to the area where their D can't get it and I can skate onto it. And that's why it feels fast and it's really frustrating because you catch them while they're going one way and the puck's now moving into a space the other. And they playing this way, you know what happens too is you draw a lot of penalties because 
invariably, what do you do? Someone's moving faster and they're going to have now a clean break for a two on one or a breakaway. So they end up, you, you draw a lot of penalties if when you execute that type of game plan properly. Side benefit. Great. Any more questions? Nothing else. I have one that I one comment you made, Daniel. That I just want you to unpack a little bit more for the coaches. Um, one of the bullet points in your slide, you talked about isolating aspects of drills, skills, and systems. Mm -hmm. Could you just unpack that a little bit more for them? Okay, so um, let's just say, for instance, uh, we're working on you know shooting, right? Really isolating. Well. I don't need 17 different elements to drill just to get to the shot. I might be working on the hand placement or just the aspect of pulling it in to your base to change the angle for that slot release. Uh, take the Austin Matthew shot, for instance, right? Right now, so if I was to isolate that down, it's just start with the, but a big, huge, wide pull into your feet, overemphasizing it. So we're getting your hands together. You're really reaching on out. And then you're really pulling it back in. So that's all we want. Just get it and then do it at a higher rate, higher volume. Okay. Now we'll take the next element of that shot where it's actually releasing it closer to your feet than you were previously. Okay. And inside your base, inside your back heel. Right. So taking that and just doing that element to it. And then on the finish to get a little bit more velocity, it's actually turn your wrist over. A lot of players when they're going to raise the puck, they'll open the, the, the blade face, uh, the face of their blade and it hopes to elevate it. But what happens is you lose velocity and a lot of times they'll now just drift over the net. So now I'll take that element and just get them to go wrist from that position and get their return, their wrist over. Now you take those three separate elements. Okay. Pull in their feet placement follow through with the, with the wrist blade going or the blade face closed. Then you add a slow movement, then you add a different movement, and then you add versus a token coach defender in the way, defender shooting and screen, and then you add it, okay, now it's a little bit more game, like now you can apply it into the real live drills. So there you took certain, like almost under a microscope, certain aspects, isolating it, and then combining it together then taking that skill and providing it in a drill. Okay. I work with the power play. That's, that's my job here in Springfield or part of my responsibilities. Well, how many of you, if I say have a one, three, one structure for your power play and most of you, yeah, yeah, that's great. We use it. It works. Well, what if you run into PKs that break it down or you're having a specific element on what you need to improve it? One for us right now is that our players have been catching in that flank window and have been carrying it about seven feet too far. So now they're running into blocks and the layers and the sticks. It just get too big at this level. Players are bigger. The offense condenses out and it's not as dangerous. So I actually have, I'm doing this tomorrow is I have to isolate it for just our flank players. You're catching it and you're releasing it from here from a slow position and then you're going to do it with speed and then we're going to add our killers, right? And hopefully they can execute. We play Bridgeport tomorrow. Keep watching the highlights. Hopefully they do it. Is that when they get to that play, because it's going to be there that they can now do it in live play in a system. Now, our guys are pretty cerebral. They're professional athletes, tend to pick stuff up pretty quick because we have video, coaches, ice time, resources, and this is their, their jobs. So we're able to kind of do that. So there's a perfect example how we'll take something in terms of our system, isolate it down for those key players that are in, inside of it, work it in, and hopefully they can execute and perform on demand just like Hockey Canada has in their kind of their POE model. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And on that, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, wrap up and uh, get Daniel out of here. Thank you coaches again for your time. Uh, thank you to you, Daniel, for your time uh, to share your valuable information and experience with our coaches. Um, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. It's good to be back at the rinks 
And hopefully we'll be able to see you all around the arenas real, real soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. A lot.